Hey there, and welcome to the first Pass the Plate episode. This is the show that combines my love of history, food knowledge, and more. This has been a hobby of mine for a couple of years now, and I'm happy to finally share what I've learned. So without further ado, please enjoy episode one. The new year is here once again. To celebrate, this first episode is about a dish called Hop and John. Hop and John has been a New Year's Day Southern tradition for more than a century. It's usually eaten on New Year's Day to bring the diner good luck, fortune, and sometimes romance in the year to come. Regardless of whether it brings luck, it's just a damn good wholesome dish. So pull up a seat, learn what it's all about, and see how it's cooked. This is a story of rice, peas, and pork. Simple ingredients, complex history. A rice culture was established in and around the South Carolina region during the antebellum period or pre-Civil War, creating a cuisine with dishes that relied heavily on rice. This cuisine, referred to as the Carolina Rice Kitchen by food historian Karen Hess, is unique to the Lowcountry and Sea Islands region of South Carolina. The Carolina Rice Kitchen is the result of the creolization of West Africans, Native Americans, Italians, and Europeans. The Venetians designed the canals and diked water systems in the marshes where the rice grew. West Africans contributed their rice management methods and cooking techniques and Native Americans brought their own knowledge and worked in the fields. Africans had the most influence on the final product because they were often the ones doing the cooking. By some turn of events, a species of rice called Carolina gold rice started to be grown in South Carolina in the mid-1600s. Carolina gold became wildly popular and was one of the first commercial varieties of rice to be exported all over the world. It was called Carolina Gold for a reason, because the rice made the Carolinas and Georgia a lot of money. The fields were also gold as well. The success and popularity of the rice helped build cities like Charleston, as well as large plantations. Unfortunately, higher demand for the rice meant higher demand for rice slaves. But the Civil War in the 1860s changed everything. Like most commodities in the antebellum south, the rice industry got hit hard. Plantations lost their labor force, not only in the form of freed slaves, but also in the general population, because to date, the Civil War has the largest death toll of any American war. By the Great Depression, Carolina Gold Rice was obsolete. It didn't help that Carolina Gold is better harvested by hand or with a small rig. It doesn't grow as well on dry land, which is how most large-scale commercial rice is grown these days. In the 1980s, a Savannah Georgian by the name of Dr. Richard Schultz collected stores of Carolina gold rice and brought it back to life. He grew and saved seeds year by year until there was enough to sell. He returned it to the South Carolina wetlands where the rice originally grew, and it is being grown on over 150 acres today. It'll likely remain too expensive to ever be produced on a massive scale, so it's probably not going to be on your local grocery store shelves in the future, Unless you live in South Carolina region, of course. However, it's available to chefs and home enthusiasts alike thanks to the heirloom grain lovers like Glenn Roberts of Anson Mill Farms. Carolina Gold is different than the commercial varieties of rice that you can find at most stores. It's a non-aromatic, long grain that is described as starchy, rich, earthy, and hazelnutty. It doesn't easily get gummy after much cooking like a lot of modern rices do. It also maintains a pleasant bite and firmness to it. A lot of people from the South Carolina low country are religious about this rice, especially the ones that have eaten it in their youth. Hop and John dishes often use a variety of peas that go by the names cow peas, field peas, black-eyed peas, or crowder peas. But the thing is, they're not actually peas at all. They're beans or legumes indigenous to West Africa. These legumes were a large part of the West African diet and were likely brought over during the slave trade, 
These peas may have been stocked on slave ships to feed their captives during the treacherous three-month journey across the Middle Passage. Black-eyed peas become the most common pea to use within Hop and John, mainly because of its wide accessibility across America. North or south, east or west, you can usually find them. However, commercial black-eyed peas are thought to become mushy and unappetizing if you overcook them, as well as remain hard and unpleasant if slightly undercooked. So they have much less margin for error. But some people find the black-eyed peas to be creamy when they break down, almost turning into a gravy. So it's all up to preference. And again, Anson Mills to the rescue because they have helped revive an heirloom variety called Sea Island Red Peas. These peas are sweet and nutty and much less prone to overcooking. If you prefer all your beans and rice separate and fluffy in your Hop and John, you should give Sea Island Red Peas a try. Southern Exposure Sea Exchange also offers some other heirloom drying beans for hobby growers. A few hobby gardeners said that they particularly like the purple hole pink-eyed peas, which seem more popular in Creole food in Louisiana. But if you're trying to do traditional Charleston Hop and John, Sea Island Red Peas are where it's at. Bacon is one of the most popular forms of pork to add some meaty smokiness to Hop and John nowadays. Though, it's more traditional to use smoked ham hock, pork gel, or pig's feet. Either way, it always depends on the region and the family that's cooking the dish. Like pretty much everything we get from the supermarket these days, pork is overly processed. When pork bellies are shipped to factories to get turned into bacon, they're injected with a nitrate water solution. Then they're either smoked or smoke flavors added to them. This results in a watery, overly salty piece of meat that has little to no porky flavor. It loosely resembles bacon, but is not technically cured and dried, so it's not the same thing as quote unquote traditional bacon. Bacon made the traditional way is and was cured in salt, sugar, and spices for four to five days to draw out the moisture. Then it's hung for another four to five days and smoked to perfection. So although the commercial bacon is very much more affordable when compared to traditionally cured bacon, once you try the real stuff, it's hard to go back. If you have space and a smoker, it'd definitely be worth it to try to make on your own. Now let's put it all together. Beans and rice together are a globally popular dish. It's a good thing it's so satisfying, delicious. Just carbs on carbs. There are so many varieties. You have red beans and rice in Louisiana, Morosi Cristianos in Cuba, Guyanese cook-up rice, Peruvian taku-taku, and so many more. Hop and John is eaten across the entire United States, but it's not always called that. For example, in Louisiana, they just call the dish black-eyed peas. Hop and John has been eaten for centuries and has a very strong African influence, being a dish that migrated from the slave's table to the owner's table. The first time it popped up in a cookbook was Sarah Rutledge's 1847 cookbook, The Carolina Housewife. The recipe is really basic. Just one pound of bacon, one pint of peas, and one pint of rice. Then cook everything in the same pot. Hop and John is also mentioned in the 1856 book Journey in a Seaboard Slave State by Frederick Law Olmsted. Like a lot of food origin stories, there's a lot of folklore and hypotheses around why the dish is called Hop and John. Some say that children hopped around the table before they could eat the beans and rice. Others say that there was a crippled food vendor who went by the name of Hop and John selling the dish on the streets of Charleston, South Carolina. Another possibility is that it's a corruption of the French term pigeon peas or pois à pigeon, or it could be based on an obscure southern saying of hop and john when guests were invited to a meal. All speculation, no one really knows. The dish originated in the South Carolina Lowcountry, but it spread in popularity across the U.S. One source suggests that a recipe in Southern Living Magazine in the 1970s might have helped push the knowledge of this dish across America. 
More recently, chefs like Sean Brock and the Golagichi chef BJ Dennis have made low country cooking more widely known and have put the cuisine of the Carolina Rice Kitchen on the map, so it might have spread with this recent wave as well. From what I can tell, low country hop and john should be like a good rice pilaf. All the grains of rice and peas are fluffy and separated, but cooked through. No extra liquid in the bottom of that pan, and no soupy texture. In Louisiana, they like to make kind of saucy gravy out of their black-eyed peas to eat alongside rice. Other areas and recipes seem to make Hop and John a bit soupy and mushy with everything just mixed all together. I'm not sure if this is a preference or a consequence of the cooking techniques used. The reason why Hop and John became a dish of luck to eat on New Year's Day also doesn't have a clear history. Serious Eats writer Robert Moss found a reference of it as a New Year's food in an October 1907 Charleston News and Courier advertisement that mentioned getting a shipment of cowpeas. Hop and John might have been seen as lucky because of its ingredients though. A lot of rice cultures see rice as lucky and eat it on New Year's Day. The large amount of individual grains you eat in a single serving can be seen as bountiful, representative of fertility and wealth. Beans or peas bring good luck because they resemble coins or shell money. One tradition says that if you leave three peas on your plate at the end of your meal, you will have luck, fortune, and romance over the next year. In some cases, a coin was cooked in the pot of rice and beans, and whoever got it received an extra portion of good luck. Another tradition has you count all the peas in your serving. Ideally, you'll get one pea for every day of the year. Pork is also eaten in many cultures for luck. Some of the reasons might be because pigs can eat pretty much anything. Give them scraps and they turn into luscious fatty meat. A pig goes from a two to three pound piglet to a 250 pound pig in six months, which is just crazy growth when you think about it. Likewise, sows have an average of 10 to 12 piglets after only four months of pregnancy. Compare that to a cow's one calf in seven months and it's easy to see how pigs might bring you growth over the next year. In some cases, people add tomato to their hop and john, which is supposed to bring good health. And if you really want to seal the deal with luck over the next year, you can eat leftover Hop and John the following day, which is then called Skip and Jenny. It shows that you're thrifty and don't want to waste what you have. As the old saying goes, peas for pennies, greens for dollars, and cornbread for gold. Hop and John is often served with stewed dark leafy greens to represent money. People use all kinds of greens, such as collard greens, turnip greens, mustard greens, kale, cabbage, and chard. The dish is also served with some good old cornbread to bring a little gold in your life. So with all that luck waiting in just one meal, it's sure to bring on some good luck and fortune over the next year. Like any dish or recipe, there are as many ways of making it as there are people that make it. Do you cook everything in one pot or spoon the beans over the rice? Do you keep it basic with rice, beans, pork, and onions, or do you add tomatoes and peppers and additional seasonings? How does your family cook it? What do you eat with it? Is this a new dish to you? Try it and tell me how it went. Make it your own. Even make it vegan and use some adobo peppers in it for smokiness. Or make it halal or kosher and use smoked turkey or chicken instead of pork. Any way you cook it and eat it, I want to wish you all good luck over the next year. Thanks for watching the first episode of Fast Plate. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like and subscribe down below so you can follow me on my journey to breaking down the origin of other foods and dishes. Peace and love, and good luck.